I'm Ron Barrick, author of the Brooks Latello Thriller Series, and with me is my good friend, Paul Levine, who has written and mastered the Jake Lassiter Series. We have a lot of things in common. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, and we'll listen to him for a couple of minutes. Well, thank you, Ryan, and it's a pleasure to be here. And one of the things we have in common is that J.K.'s Code and Cheater's Game, your new book, my new book, though both are novels, that is fiction, are both grounded in reality and things that are happening and have happened in 2020. Why don't you tell us a bit about yours? Well, uh, Jake's Code started out to be about uh, the dark web and cyber currency and stuff like that until when I went on the dark web, I met some people that were really weird and that made me a little nervous. And I ended up with Jake's code about a 20 year old youngster, much like the protagonist in your cheaters game who decided he was going to go off and take the world by storm. And, uh, I have Jake Lassiter, you have your young Jake, and in my case, Jake's nephew is 20, and he gets himself in Cheater's Game in quite a fix. He is the kid, <clears throat> excuse me, who's an imposter taking the test. He's kind of a brilliant savant, taking the SAT and ACT exams for money for rich kids, I call the young and the shiftless, uh, and his uncle Jake has to defend him in federal court, well knowing that he is guilty of doing what the government says he did. And somewhat similar, uh, my Jake Klein, otherwise known as Jake or JK, um, he drops out of school to make his fortune uh, in the world of cybersecurity. He stumbles across some bad guys who have written software to fix uh, and control the 2020 election. And he figures the way he's going to make his fortune is when he writes his own software to block the software of the bad guys. And the question that really arises is how did Jake manage to know so well how our real-time, real-world election was going to turn out. I figure you had a, a mole, a spy in the White House or the CIA or someplace because there is so much reality in your fiction. you have any secrets besides uh, groping around there on the dark web, which has uh, its own connotations? Anything you want to share with us? Well, I don't know. If I share it with you, I may have to kill you. Ah, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just have to say that Jake somehow manages to go back and forth between the Kremlin and the White House and seems to come up with a lot of things that uh, he discovered to be going on before the rest of us uh, starting about a week ago, learned was going on. And the week ago, for people who are watching and listening to this later, uh, Ron is talking about the November 3 election. Uh, whereas uh, my book, Cheater's Game, is grounded in the ongoing college admissions scandal in which about three dozen parents of the rich and the shiftless uh, have already pleaded guilty and a couple of dozen more are scheduled to go on trial in federal court in Boston. And what fascinated me from the day that the scandal broke was, was this question, and I weave this through the book. What were these parents thinking? What messages were they sending to their kids when they decided they had to cheat in order to get them into so-called elite or prestigious universities? Because to me, I thought, well, what you're saying to them is you're not good enough. Without my money and my connections, you're never going to make it. And the, those legal and ethical and moral and parenting questions are what turned me on to this subject. 
So it's, it's interesting. We both write about lawyers and the goings on in their lives because we are both lawyers in the real world. How do you think it is that we both seem to have somewhat of a rather uh, sharp take uh, <laughs> on our uh, legal profession and the surrounds of that profession. Well, you can't practice law for a couple of decades and not get a little jaded, a little cynical, a little skeptical about what my character, Jake Lassiter, calls the so-called justice system. Uh, when I, before I went to law school, I was a reporter for the Miami Herald, and both before and after, I became friendly with three or four judges in Miami. Uh, three of those people who I knew from the time I was this 21-year-old reporter, three of those judges ended up in prison. So when, when you see the, the people in the black robes on the other side of the bench, uh, when you see lawyers who are bribing them also going to prison, how could you not be a little bit jaded? I ask you, Rod. Yeah, and, and I, I get it, and I've experienced it. And the only thing that, in my mind, maybe exceeds uh, the cynicism uh, and the questionable ethics and integrity of the legal system is if you look at our political system. And you only have to look as far as the last four years, and I don't have a preference. I look askance at both sides of the aisle, and they I think they all have a little bit of good here and there, but maybe a lot more questionable. And uh, my Jake, Jake Klein, JK, he manages to dig into that in Jake's code with some real um, interesting insight, especially for such a young guy. Well, that's what makes your book so interesting, that they are grounded in reality and that you can draw out of what we're seeing every day in the news. And then if you just, just turn it a little bit, and put the fictional twist on it, it's it's sort of it's the old novelist question, what if? You know, here's here's the situation. What if this happened? Holy cow, some A leads to B, B leads to C, and, and, and that's our plot. All that having been said, I still find humor in the courtroom. And um, I, I've toyed with that over the years, and Jake Lasseter is something of a wise guy in court and gets in trouble with, with judges. But I do think uh, there are great opportunities to lighten the mood with humor in, in court. Well, um, as one who has read most of the novels in the Jake uh, Lassiter series, um, I really enjoy his sense of humor. Maybe something he got from you. Uh, <laughs> It's a great series of books up to Thank and including uh, Cheater's Game, and I would commend that series and that novel to all who may find themselves listening to our banter, and um, this has been a lot of fun. It, it, it has been, and I would uh, write back at you, Ron Barrick. I would recommend your novels. May I tell you about my first jury trial? where I learned so much? Absolutely. If I can remember it, because it's deep in the last century, but uh, I was trying a really boring case. I was six months out of law school, so I would have been about 25 and a half years old. And I got all the way to closing argument. It was a lawsuit over um, water filters that didn't work correctly, a commercial litigation case. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm giving closing argument, and I notice that one of the jurors has fallen asleep. I don't know what to do. I should have just gone on, but I didn't. I go up and I approach the judge, and I say, Your Honor, Your Honor, look look, look at number three. I mean, he, he's snoring. 
And the judge looked down at me from the bench with disdain, and he said, Mr. Levine, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. So with, with that as my very first experience in a jury trial on my own, um, I set out into the world to do that, and then gravitated toward this somewhat cynical, wisecracking lawyer who uh, looks for justice and doesn't always find it. Well, I think we have tripped across and discovered uh, perhaps another common trait. Um, I have had uh, a couple of jury trials along the way. Um, not only did I have jurors that I managed to put to sleep, <laughs> I can think of a couple of judges I put to sleep. I, I would like to have had some judges fall asleep. I, I, I'm not going to bore you with stories, but there was an appellate judge in Miami who did not care for me or my arguments. And uh, when I would argue to a three-judge panel, he would turn around in his chair and stare at the opposite wall, the wall behind him, and not face me, leaving me to look at the back of his head as his uh, signaling, I guess, that he had already decided. <laughs> why, lis why listen to this young lawyer with his fancy arguments? Well, I, I, I think with our um, uh, judicial experiences, Maybe it's not so difficult to understand how we both turned uh, to writing novels and writing about lawyers instead of being lawyers. Well, we're able to, one of the great things about writing them is you, you get to not only ask the questions, but give the answers in court. <laughs> you can only do one of those things. And, uh, and of course, we're all the product of everything that came before. Uh, Scott Turo, who's a pal and a wonderful writer and a wonderful guy, prosecuted corrupt judges in Chicago when he was an assistant U.S. attorney. And you can see in his work the uh, corruption that comes through as part of the justice system going all the way back to presumed innocent. Um, so, yes, that's who we are, Ron. You and I and these other warriors of the courtroom are now... Uh, pounding away on the keyboards. Well, um, I think that uh, we're both going to sit back and watch how what you wrote about in Cheater's Game and I wrote about in Jake's Code unfolds in the real world. There's some more people to be tried uh, and prosecuted real time in uh, cheaters game and of course we're going to see what history if not the courts have to say um, about um, our politicians in Washington DC stay tuned as they say and I hope you and I can come back and do this again sometime absolutely really enjoyed it take care Paul thank you Ron Barrett